Hello, welcome to the next in our series of webcasts on demystifying IFRS 9. I'm Sandra Thompson, I lead our global IFRS technical accounting function on financial instruments. I'm here today with Jerome Burkhardt. Jerome is a partner in Belgium in our banking practice and is helping our clients implement IFRS 9 there. Today is the second of two webcasts talking about how to measure expected credit losses or ECL. Today we're going to talk about what's a 12 month ECL. We're going to talk about what's the life over which to measure the ECL amount and we're also going to touch on collateral credit enhancements and financial guarantees. So Jerome, can we start off, can you tell us what's, what's meant by a 12 month ECL? Sure. For so-called stage one assets, so those assets for which there has not been a significant increase in credit risk, the standard requires to account for loss allowance equal to a 12 month expected credit loss. So what does that mean? Let's start by looking at a lifetime expected credit loss. The lifetime expect expected credit loss is the cash shortfall that we expect from any default over the life of the loan. The 12 month expected credit loss is a portion of that, whereby we only consider those defaults which are expected to occur over the next 12 months. For those defaults, we consider the total expected cash shortfall. So not just the cash payments which will be missed in the next 12 months. Let's take an example. If we have a five year loan, we will first look at what is the probability that that loan will default over the next 12 months. Secondly, we will consider what are the total cash shortfalls we expect if that loan defaults over the next 12 months. Thank you, Jerome. Now I understand in practice, some loans may default and then cure and then redefault. How's that factored into the calculation? That's an excellent question. The consideration we have to make is whether that re-default is related to the initial default. If the default is related, then it is the same event and it should be considered for the expected credit loss calculation. If, however, the re-default is an unrelated event, then you should not take it into consideration for the expected credit loss calculation. However, in practice, it might not be such a big issue. The credit risk models are quite used to dealing with those situations and they know how to handle that when developing the models. Thanks very much. We're going to move on now and talk about the life over which to measure the ECL. Now, I should be clear up front, we are not talking about revolving credit facilities. We'll come on to those in our next webcast. But for non-revolving credit facilities, the standard's clear. The maximum life is the contractual life, but it may be shorter. You're looking at the life over which the bank is, ex is exposed to credit risk. And the first thing to consider is whether the bank has any termination rights. So again, let's take an example. Let's consider a mortgage loan that perhaps has a maximum life of 20 years, but where the bank has the right to terminate that mortgage loan every six months. If the bank's right is substantive, then the period used is six months, not the, the longer life of 20 years. However, it is important to consider whether the bank actually has the substantive right to terminate. For example, if the local regulatory conditions are such that a bank couldn't in practice terminate a loan, for example, they couldn't evict a borrower from their home, then the life is the longer life and not six months. The next thing to consider is borrower prepayment options. And again, mortgages are a good example. Many mortgages have a contractual life of say 25 or 30 years, but it's inspected that in practice, most borrowers will prepay before then and you factor those prepayment options and the expectations of when they will be exercised into the life. And this is commonly done by splitting a group of mortgages into cohorts with expected prepayment dates at different times. Jerome, can I pass back to you to talk a bit about collateral and credit enhancements and financial guarantees? Yes. We mentioned that the expected credit loss looks at the cash shortfalls in the scenario of default. So, what are the cash inflows we should be considering? If we look at collateral, financial guarantees, or any other credit enhancements, we should consider them as part of the cash inflows if they are an integral part to the contract and if they're not already accounted for. Otherwise, we would be double counting them. So, how should we be considering being an integral part of the contract? There, the ISB Technical Implementation Group has clarified that the concept of integral part should be understood widely. So it's not just those elements which are explicitly mentioned in the contract, but also things which would be foreseen in local regulations or local legislations. For instance, if you have a local guarantee that is foreseen by the legislation, you would take it into consideration. 
However, if a bank decides to acquire a credit enhancement only after the origination of the contract, then that would be a separate contract and it would not be considered for the expected credit-loss calculation. In practice, it's mostly going to be a presentation issue. If it's not considered as part of the expected credit loss calculation, you will consider it as a separate asset. So from a P&L perspective, the impact will be neutral, but you will present it gross on the balance sheet. Thanks very much, Jerome. So just to recap, we've talked again today about how to measure ECL. We've talked about what's meant by a 12-month ECL. We've touched on how to determine the life of the exposure for ECL measurement. And Jerome's just talked about how to factor in collateral and particularly financial guarantees. That's it for today. I hope you'll join us next time. And if you'd like to subscribe for the whole series, then please use the subscribe button. Bye-bye.